Hey, Nancy, I'm just so happy that you joined us today. How are you today? Hey, Misty, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you and be in conversation. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your artistic journey? Yes, so I am a psychiatrist and author, and so I was kind of on this path for years of becoming a physician and then a psychiatrist after that, and it took years. And so I'm going along, but I also felt as I was going on this journey of becoming a physician, a very circuitous route, that I felt this calling and it would show up as these whispers that said, hey, let's, let's paint an abstract watercolor or, you know, let's write a book or something like that. <laughs> so I had these artistic urgings, but I was very busy in my training. And so one day at the very last day of seven years after medical school training, and I had done, you know, internal medicine, diagnostic radiology, psychiatry, child psychiatry. Finally, there was the day that I graduated and I was 32 years old and I had this urging immediately. I said to myself, I want to learn sculpture. And I didn't know where I was going to go to do this, how to start. So I just looked in the, at that time, the, the yellow pages. <laughs> we, we used to have phone books. <laughs> and there was no sculpture teacher out there for me. So I ended up calling a place called the Pacific Art League in Palo Alto. And one thing led to another. I found my teacher. I wanted to take private lessons in her home because I said, I don't know what I'm doing. And the moment I said, I don't know what I'm doing, she said, great, fantastic. And I knew I had found my teacher when I heard that. So I got a 25 pound bag of clay, took it to her home and we began. And this began my journey and it started. And here's the interesting thing is that you begin a journey and then you never know what will open up next. So there was this bluebird that happened that I had no idea ahead of time was going to happen. I started out with sculpture and loved it, working in clay, building up in clay and creating these Italian plaster models or molds, cracking it open, pouring the molds, all of that, the old Italian method. And then uh, unbeknownst to me at the beginning, my teacher was a watercolor, watercolorist as well. And so then when I saw that, I said, hey, will you teach me watercolor? And she said, sure, I'm not a watercolor teacher, but yeah. And so I started painting watercolors and doing sculpture. And then that unfolded into collage. And then one thing led to another, got into oils. And before you know it, then I was painting an abstract, you know, more and more abstract. I went from kind of figures and landscapes to more and more abstract expressionism or non-objective painting and into mixed media and going larger and all these steps along the way it was scary at times because of not knowing again i don't know what i'm doing right and so but one thing leads to another and i believe that when we take a step, it opens up another possibility and that's called the adjacent possible. And so that comes from evolutionary biology. It's a concept. And so anyway, it's like that is, it's so powerful to really listen to these, these creative impulses, these callings, because they can be very subtle and easily missed or dismissed. I couldn't agree more. And I love the fact that you bring this up because I know as a professional artist, they really try to teach you to focus on one thing and really be known for that one thing. But um, I love the fact that you have to be brave enough to try those creative urges or those creative callings to try to do other things so that way you can evolve creatively. And uh, I love the fact that you brought that up and um, just taking each step and knowing when it was time to let go before you start the next journey. So I really love that you um, talk into that because um, 
I started uh, following you um, some time ago back, but I loved the one piece that I really loved that you talked about because I was, I felt so bad. I felt so guilty for stopping so many times, but then you wrote this piece that was talking about, um, there's like a million steps before you get to one. Um, and, and I just really resonated with that. I'm just like, no, I just been doing all the things before I get to one. And, and it just, it kind of, um, release that guilt and shame for me being creative, um, like just creative and exploring all of these different things versus to have such a structure and rigid to that. Yes. I really believe that what we begin to understand as we go along this path is that it's really about allowing as we begin to allow these creative impulses to come through these subtle ones. And we say yes to them instead of ignoring them or dismissing them. What we find out is that it's really about evolving. It's really about evolving your art, evolving your life. It's continually in flux. It's continually in movement. And so when you invite that in and you explore and you experiment, then you realize it's okay. And it's not, you're not perhaps so kind of rigid with yourself, right? And so you kind of move beyond this concept that there are these rules. And so many people have spoken about that. Victor Hugo, the writer, Picasso, Helen Frankenthaler, you know, really that in essence, there are no rules. <laughs> You are the author, the composer, and the artist, and you are on this journey of unfolding whatever is trying to come through you. You know, uh, that's so interesting that you brought that up because I think it was yesterday or the day before I started reading this article about throwing out the rules because we as artists, actually create the rules like we don't have to follow rules we're actually creating something out of nothing and so there are no rules this is it's all up to us and what we like whatever we decide and um, it was such an exciting thought for me and i'm just like wow so instead of trying to do abc i like what happens if i did this this and this and like what would really happen and um, i found myself i didn't really create anything like no masterpiece, but I found myself having more fun. And um, I found a couple things that I do want to explore a little bit more and all because of, you know, I think it was like a podcast or something like that. And I'm just like, wow, that's so, <laughs> throw out the rules. You don't need them. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I was, I, I think about this a lot and it's like, you know, we have principles and foundational concepts that we can be aware of and explore like value, value patterns, uh, no tan, you know, uh, in, intuitive composing and all these kinds of things. And, and that's kind of like knowledge. It's kind of like the roots in the trunk of a tree. It's kind of, kind of the big concepts, the big ideas that you can play with, right? But yet they're not rules. And so, and then, and it's like, if you can play with the big idea and the big idea might be, you have a dream of, of exploring continuous line, or you are drawn to particular shapes or colors or whatever. And you want to go down that path for a while in a series. So you come from that big idea rather than from the outside in, it's the inside out. You don't want to start at the leaves. And to me, technique is the leaves. And we don't want to lead with technique, okay? I mean, you know, technique can be fun and all of that, but it's like, it's like the little pieces out here. And I see a lot of artists trying to grab technique after technique after technique and even leading with technique, but it, it, but it doesn't get you to that deepest place, I don't think. And that deepest place comes from the inside that can be informed by concepts, but not ruled by rules, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it makes so much sense because uh, I am a structured girl and uh, I kind of like building uh, order from chaos, 
but I started to realize that it was hindering me um, in terms of what I'm able to create and the joy that I have from creating those things. So I've been trying to explore these ideas of not having to do things in a certain way or a certain order or like how I mix things and really because I'm working with color. And so who's this say that I can't use a certain color with a certain color and why is mud ugly? Um, <laughs> I love mud. <laughs> and so, you know, like really explore those things and why brightness is, um, you know, is more desired than the mud. So it's, uh, it's been a really fun thing for me to kind of explore and challenge my own beliefs and some of those rules, you know, with creating that way. Yeah, it's so interesting because there's so much paradox in painting and in, in creating. I, every time I turn around, there's another paradox. And one of the paradoxes is, yeah, the beauty of mud and the uh, power of it. And, and then there's like the power of the ugly painting. So that's a real paradox because I believe that ugly paintings are the nascent embryonic forms of new work that is trying to emerge. It's trying to be born. And at first we don't see it, we don't recognize it, we're uneasy with it, it's awkward, we reject it, we're allergic to it. And yet it might be the beginnings of something astonishing, right? And it might be actually something that right, you may see it as ugly right now, but 10 years down the road, you'll go, wow, that, that piece still wows me. You know, I actually found an old, old, portrait like one of the very first ones that I did and I hated it and buried it and it fell out of an old book of mine I'm just like this is the cutest little thing I've ever seen and then I flipped it over to see who made it it was mine I thought somebody had like one of my artistic friends sent me one of her sketchbook pages it was mine and I'm just like and it told me I like I made it at the Barnes and Noble in Anchorage uh, and it like told me the time of the day and what I was doing while making it. And I'm just like, what? I'm like, I can't even believe, I don't even remember making this. And, um, but it was just one of those moments for me um, when I didn't know that it was my own, it was beautiful. And yeah, that's I was like, beautiful. wow. Yeah, it's like we invite back these orphaned off parts of ourselves. And, and it's like, these pieces that we reject and we see them as ugly or other and then they fall away and then that beautiful story where you refound that piece and it and at first didn't even know it was yours but that somehow it, it still somehow you allowed it to live though somehow it it survived through this time in that book and there it is and it's waiting for you perhaps to catch up to it. It was out there in your future, right? It was, yeah. it's in you, it's in you and it, and it was expressing something. And sometimes we're not there yet to receive it, right? Yeah, I could like, actually that really makes me think uh, so much, uh, actually makes me kind of emotional to think about that piece because I, I remember at that time, because I was working full time, I was going through cancer treatment, and I just did not have the mental capacity to like focus on those arts. And I was just like, one day I'm going to be an artist. And one day I'll be able to make like really pretty things. And um, years later, you know, I'm, I'm still learning to be an artist. And I don't think I'll ever finish that journey. But it's nice to know that that little hope, that little, just a little spark, I've been able to take like little tiny steps and uh, just to get to that moment. But I think I'm going to be cherishing um, that picture. And actually, I believe with what you said, I'm going to frame it because I think it has much deeper meaning than what I actually thought it did. So thank you for that. Yes. You know, it's that, that is a beautiful story. And I actually got goosebumps when you were talking about that. And I think that, that sometimes something deeply meaningful and kind of ineffable and inarticulable comes through an early work and we don't understand it at the time. And this is why I ask artists oftentimes to, 
let their work live, let it be, don't necessarily throw it out or, or go back over it. Let it be and move on because 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, that piece might have a message for you in there. I came across a, the very first sculpture I made in that very first private class with my teacher uh, was a, a pregnant woman, very pregnant. And this was when I was 32. I was not pregnant, had, had not been, you know, I wasn't married or anything, but it was a pregnant woman with a youthful body and yet her face was 80 years old. And it was just one of these interesting things where if I got caught up in rules, I would say, oh, that's, a, that's not unified. I must change that. But I didn't. And her, this cachectic, elderly, bony face showed up. And I just allowed it to be, even though it was it, uh, seemingly a mismatch with the rest of the body. But I believe that there's a deep message and story in that that continues to live. It's like a dream. You know how dreams are like, they are like gems and they can teach us things and they don't often make sense, but they have deep meanings. And so I think we, it's good to live with your art like that and allow all of it especially what, what feels uncomfortable to be. I love that. I, I'm going to make sure that even moving forward, um, I'm going to continue to keep those pieces. I don't throw away anything anymore. And I always leave a timestamp and uh, love notes to myself so I can remember, because I'm very forgetful and I can forget very quickly. And so having those reminders remind me uh, because I'm so forgetful, it's really nice to connect back to those because I can remember once I give myself those cues, I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I, I can remember all these things now. And um, yes. so that, I think that that is like so valuable for us, um, especially starting artists. And I don't even think just the starting artists, I think maybe even um, seasoned artists to really understand that um, all of their art actually has a meaning for us. And it's not just for professional work or anything, but even with that professional work, there's a message for us there. I, I really love that. I believe that art is really, to me, about getting at meaning and aliveness. And, and I believe that there's a deep value in, in writing about this and documenting this and keeping an art journal or notes electronically, whatever it is, but documenting your journey, documenting your ahas and revelations, your struggles, your not knowings and all of that, because documentation confers value. We've, you know, that we value something. We want to bring it from the invisible to the visible. We bring it into awareness. And that's what I hear that you, you are doing with your art. You know, and it's interesting because now that you say that, I can actually see that. And I struggled so much with uh, even just, uh, you know, restarting my journey or taking the next, not restarting, but taking the next step um, of my journey is allowing myself to just create, um, just explore and not be perfect at whatever I'm trying to create and actually give myself that space because so often I got trapped in that thought that, um, I, you know, in order for me to be able to live my dreams or to be an artist, I actually had to create like these beautiful, perfect, uh, prolific, uh, like sketches and drawings before I even touched a pencil. And it's just like, I, I stunted myself so much just by not giving myself that permission to just have that creative freedom. Um, with all yes. of that. This is a big one, big, and that is there's this perfectionism that shows up that we, many of us, probably most of us, grapple with continually. And the power of, of telling yourself that you don't, it's not about creating a masterpiece. If you really can finally begin to get that, 
if you can move off of that you need to create a masterpiece and you really get into the attitude of experimentation and the attitude that of the power of the ugly painting and you and, and you really get into accessing the adjacent possible and you work in a series because then that helps you to make it not so precious because you're you're really in there like a scientist and you are exploring variations on whatever that big idea is that you're looking at in that particular it could be you know two to five to two hundred paintings and then you also listen if something else calls you and go ahead and do that as well you're not trapped in this thing of this series but really this is enormous to kind of grapple with this issue of the masterpiece and and how you talk to yourself makes all the difference in moving through that and going for that you know experimentation yeah no definitely i that just resonates so much with me and just knowing like I, I, the perfectionism definitely stops you dead in your tracks. And then it also gives you that, you know, it kind of stunts you from giving yourself um, that permission to create, because if your art doesn't look like Picasso or any, like whoever you uh, admire, when your work yeah. doesn't actually look like theirs, you know, you stop your process once again. And as I've traveled along this journey, as I'm starting to realize it's not me trying to emulate um, the people that I admire the most. Actually, what, it, what I admire is that they were actually creating. What I want to emulate is that, is that ability to be able to create, share my stories, put the colors down and do things in a way that feels right to me versus creating something that is praised or well liked or well received or told to be good work like that rewarding system that we have growing up if we do something good then we get praised and then it's worthy of doing and yes. so you know getting out of that position and get, like making yourself giving yourself that approval giving yourself that acceptance and love for your work and um but this is i mean this is something that it's only been, been a very short period of time that i have been able to acknowledge within myself is that you know what i really want and what i love the most about my artists that i follow is that they actually gave themselves permission to create show up and do what they wanted to do versus getting the permission and the validation from outside sources that's huge and that is absolutely and we can learn from seeing artists who have been able to move through that territory and that is to move from extrinsic validation or external validation to internal or intrinsic validation that you define what you want to do what you love, what you value, what you're going to explore and experiment with. It comes from the inside. It's an inside job. It's not an outside thing. And when you begin to finally move off of looking out there for approval, but rather coming from in here of allowing, which is also allowing, you know, the un uneasy pieces to come through and really getting the value of that and getting the value of experimentation that is a big big thing in your cycle as an artist in your life cycle as an artist when you start to get that and i think that it's a natural sequence where in the beginning artists tend to kind of emulate other artists because you know they say i don't know what i'm doing and we're learning and all of that and then eventually you get that you want to move off of that. Whether you're emulating, you know, you know Helen Frankenthaler or Ty Twombly, Ty Twombly or what, whomever, Picasso, whatever. Finally, that is a dead end because it's not coming from inside of you. And, and we ultimately get that. It ends up being boring and not gratifying. But then here's another danger that happens after that. Finally, we've stopped emulating, you know, the masters or the, the ones we look up to. 
finally we've started to come from the inside and we start really going there and accessing the adjacent possible and ex exploration and all of that and then another danger arises and that danger is it we begin to repeat ourselves the danger is a success catastrophe it's it's the situation where you're going along you finally expressing yourself and perhaps you might even start getting seen and known and you know selling your work selling out shows all these things the danger there is to just barely change it all so you can keep repeating that success and so we go from emulating others to emulating ourselves and this is a real danger this is a real danger for people who are along on their journey and so that's where we really got to double down again just like we did before when we were emulating others now we got to double down again and say wait a minute got to keep experimenting got to keep taking those risks going to that edge you know you've got all these collectors they love your work but you don't want to keep doing the same thing you've, you've got to keep evolving as an artist so it's always there that we've got to keep pushing ourselves to that edge <laughs> that really struck a nerve right there because um i was you know i have already been thinking about those kind of those kind of things in my own art is like um creating um what's wanted by our customers or our clients or our family members or who knows who's requesting something and so that really um hits a little ping point and um what i've been doing is like oh um you know i can still create art um, professionally but then i'll just keep my sketchbook just for me and i can do whatever i want and you know i can have all sorts of just i can do whatever i wish but i think that there's i think there's an important piece um, that we need to recognize as artists is that you know we do actually we can make the choice of being able to be creative expressively open because i think that we we hide so many things so that way we put our best face forward and um and not show all of our work uh, and i and i understand it from a business perspective so that way you know um, people know what store they're shopping at but um that's not who we are as human beings and it's definitely not us as artists, or at least not me. And I'm sure that there are people who like to do those things, but for certainly for not me. Um, I, I, I guess I would have a question is like, how do you actually help yourself from getting into that kind of pattern? Yeah, so that, that's um, an area. So <clears throat> I think that that's where you want to stay aware of that tendency to fall back to safety the safety of emulating others the safety of emulating your own successes and knowing that it may feel good for a little bit but ultimately that's going to not be gratifying either if you're not you know evolving your work and again and evolving is like it, there's incremental changes. It's not like you got to constantly, you know, jump from this to that, but it's continually moving and risking and threading it through. You know, I do have artists who have kind of a bread, you know, kind of bread and butter paintings that they sell. And, and, you know, and so what they'll do is like have this group of paintings that they sell. And so they'll have this group of paintings that they sell and then then they give themselves space to do their deep experimentation where they don't care what anybody thinks about it always to give themselves that space that's so important even if over here they're doing commissions it might be dog portraits you know whatever it is they might continue to do that that's their bread and butter and that's fine and they are artists 
which means they are evolving their work, evolving their art, continually exploring from the world, the intersections of art, science, life, relationships, all of it comes through and it's endless. I think that that is a, like a really important point for us to be able to um, acknowledge and to be able to understand that this is part of the process and it is a part of that balance, but you don't have to, I guess, put them in like little boxes. You can, you can be all of those boxes all mixed in together. And uh, I, I really, I really like like that idea because I, I mean, you could even look from behind. I have all my little boxes. And um, so, but I think it, it would be a lot easier to do if it's not so um, categorized and so like separated and being able to blend all those pieces in together and maybe even find a level of, uh, of a happier um, place with your artwork and what you're doing. Um, Hold on, Nancy. I'm sorry. I've got the um, landscapers out there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to the art portion. I'm going to hit mute so that way um, they don't interrupt us um, okay. because they're like right underneath my window. <laughs> no worries. So what are we going to do next then? What, what do we do next, Misty? So now what we'll do is I'll ask you, like, how do you start um, to just play and explore in your um, art journal and then you can go ahead and start sharing like your process and just sharing all of those different things with us and then um, okay. I'm going to hit mute. All right so I know that you have like a system for yourself to be able to explore those things. Can you share a little bit more about that process that you have when you approach your art and um, how you kind of teach your students those same steps? Yes, so there are many ways that I have of starting. I'm very big on creating lots of starts, painting starts, and not getting so caught up in so-called finishes. So, um, so that's one thing, lots of starts. And there's this concept that is deep in my mind, and it's called zero to one. So zero to one is a mathematical concept that is just fascinating to me. And so this concept is that from zero to one is the largest interval. It's larger than one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on. That from zero to one, and this can be proven mathematically, I won't get into that here, uh, from nothing to something, zero being nothing, one something, is larger than one to two, something to something, two to three, something to something. So that concept informs me in my art because it says just starting is enormous. Just starting. So go into your studio and just start. Start mixing paint. Um, for me, it's like swimming. It's like, go put your toe in the water. <laughs> and you can say no after that if you want to, but just start. And the interesting thing is once you start, it tends to activate further activity. It tends to kind of nudge us on because we start to get into it. It's like, oh, okay, okay. And then we're in it. So there's that. And I think it's also good to, uh, to kind of come from a place of ease as much as you can. So ease and playfulness and that joy that you were talking about. And so, so kind of that. And then the last piece, and I'm holding this in my mind because this is giving me permission, is allowing for the ugly painting to emerge and actually embracing it and saying, this is fantastic because who knows where that might go. So I'm going to show you all one, this is only one, there's so many that I have, and it was like, which one do I show you? <laughs> so this one I'm going to show you is called the six maquette exercise. And so a, a maquette is a little study. And Henry Moore, the great sculptor, English sculptor, used to create 
thousands, probably tens of thousands of maquettes from clay and, and looking at pieces of sea drift, you know, in the, in nature and just these little pieces, but he would play with it. And this would inform his colossal, enormous sculptures that you've seen all over the world. So you play with ideas. So I love the idea of maquettes. So it's, we're playing with ideas here. We're not going to be caught up in what it looks like. We, we don't care what it looks like. We actually want to be surprised because we're cultivating surprise, cultivating surprise ability. So all of these concepts, this inner landscape is very important for you as an artist so that you can continually evolve your work. That's what we're interested in. So that I'm going to start this ma these maquettes and I'll guide you through it. And again, I invite you to just allow. So you can get a journal or you can get a piece of paper out in front of you. You could even get newsprint if you want. And I encourage you to get out some different tools if you can, if you've got them. Different types of tools, like I've got this wide brush here. I've got a shaper. I have a sash brush. You know, different tools that will give you different marks. I've got a long brush that's very thin. And uh, you could use a spatula, anything. Uh, you could also have markers of various sorts, pencils. Um, I have a little piece of charcoal here. You know, whatever it is, you know, a few tools, any kind of thick markers, thin, it doesn't matter, anything you want. Um, <clears throat> So kind of gather some supplies if you can, or you can just watch this and, and try this later. And again, you can work in your journal. I'm going to work on a big board here. Let me move this forward so we can get closer to it. I'm working on a big board so you can see, you can see it better, right? Okay, so give me just a moment and the way I'm going to start and I would invite you to do this too, is we're gonna, first of all, we're gonna create six squares or rectangles on this sheet of paper, okay? I'm just gonna divide it up. So I hope you can see this. I'm just making some squares. I so see it mark, perfectly. Perfect. So just mark off your squares or your rectangles. And, you know, don't worry about it. This is about experimentation. We're not worried about what this looks like. Okay, and let's get another one. Okay. So, We've got our six squares marked off, or six um, rectangles if that's what you decided. And then you can start with any, any one of these, but what we're going to do is we're gonna make six moves on each square. So six moves, and you can change things up. I recommend that you consider to constrain your palette if you do this like maybe just two colors or three, you know, don't throw in everything if you can, because it just simplifies, we're trying to simplify things here, okay? On the other hand, you can put every color that you've got in there if you wish. <laughs> so it's not really about the colors. Um, I'm just gonna make a move. So again, Go in and just make six moves on each one. So I'm, I'm working on this center one. I'm just going to start working into it. And 
we're making six moves. I love the concept of the moves. Yeah. And we're not thinking, we're just, it's just spontaneous stream of consciousness and just keep moving along. And <clears throat> You can change up your your arm, you know, work with a different hand if you wish. I'm gonna actually try that non-dominant hand. Mm-hmm. And um It's interesting to, to do that, switch it up. You can add in, throw in a wild card color if you want. Something speaks to you. Now, Nancy, when you normally do this, do you use music or do you actually sit with your thoughts? Well, a lot of times I'm, it's silent. You know, I just hear the scratching sound. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so probably with my thoughts, you know, whatever's, or non-thought. <laughs> um, I'm with you. I like to be along with my thoughts and um, it's really nice to be able to do that while I create. Yeah. Well, one of the exercises I was thinking about showing you all has to do with music. So maybe, maybe for another time. <laughs> I, I have uh, played a little bit with that and um, it does make different marks. It, yes. Yes. There's a whole thing on that. Right. If you lose count of, you know, how many moves you made, don't worry about it. <laughs> now, what do you normally do with these moves? Like, how do you process that? Or like, how, I guess, how do you implement them later on into something? Yeah. Yeah, so what happens is I just do these, you know, mech hats, and, and again, no judging, censoring, this is stream of consciousness, this is just six moves, and it, they can be, you know, you can vary the moves, and the more you do this, the more you'll just keep going into these edges of moves that are unfamiliar and so forth, and sometimes I just let them be as they are, Sometimes I'll later, I might go in and integrate them, like move, you know, move across the line there into the next one so that they're, they start to connect together. And oh, you can yeah. make these closer together if you want, and they can run into each, each other. But lots of times students will do this and they'll go, wow, I just really love it. And they'll frame it. I've had people do that. Um, but that's, you know, not, not really the point, um, but it's more about this experience invites allowing, invites loosening up, invites your gestural expression, because when you make a move that opens up a whole set of paths that weren't there before, that's the adjacent possible, you're opening up as you create, you're affecting creation itself. Every move opens up 
the set of possibilities that wasn't there before that move was made. And so we are creating continuously. And when we go in there without strategic mind, without a plan, something astonishing can happen because we, we didn't plan it. We get the mind out of the way and allow the gestural expression to come through. And just that is so valuable because when you can take that to your other work and it informs it. It's, I've had many students say it loosens them up, new moves come through because they've been creating these starts. These starts may never see the light of day in terms of an audience, or they might. Uh, but they they fuel you, and they and this this will start to show up in your other work, even if you're doing pet portraits, you know, yeah. even if you're doing very representational paintings. It will start to come through because you. This is like you know when you play the cello, you practice scales, and, and that has more kind of you know concepts in terms of perhaps rules. But it, it's kind of like working with the instrument, which is your body and your gestural expression and, and allowing it. You know, I don't know if you quilt or do anything like that, but I think that um, that is actually a really important um, a, a concept for us as artists to um, know is that gestural freedom and just our own signatures there. One of the, like, if you go back and you look at like those antique quilts that are like in museums and things like that, they actually talk, they don't look at like the perfection of the quilt. They're actually looking for misperfections. And it's not even mis it's not even the imperfections, it's our signature. And because we, yes. we hold our pencils in a way that only we hold them, we stitch in only a way that we stitch and they can actually identify the artist who made the quilt just by their stitches because no, like every so many stitches, it does something and it's consistent yes. it, we have patterns in those. And so these starts can actually help us develop that signature that's uniquely us. Yes, I've seen, is it the G's Bend, uh, some of those quilts and yes, and I come from a family of quilters. I, I actually started quilting when I was four years old and it was the crazy quilts that yes. you just piece together wildly <laughs> by hand, by hand. And I love that. And yeah, all of this is like you have your own lexicon uh, that comes through your body and your gestural expression. And, and I take uh, physicians at Stanford every year for 10 years I've done this at Sierra Camp. And I take them through an exercise. It's, it's where we, we create these starts related to a word or music. And it's like I assert that you have your own particular lexicon, your own particular signature that will thread through all your work. And this is what we see too with the maquette, the maquettes, whether it's clay maquettes or the, these kinds of maquettes, you do have moves that will come through. I just, I, I love that. And I have never put those together ever um, before, but that is absolutely brilliant and I like it's like it's proof it's scientific proof because I, I mean I worked uh, you know I worked in um, these libraries and uh, museums that actually were looking specifically for those things so I used to work in restoration and uh, we were looking for specific things and that's exactly how we could identify those things and it's just so interesting that I never put those two together well, that is it. I mean, this is creativity right here, right now. You put that together. It's about the intersections and putting things together. And we're, this is what happens when we start to create. And creative conversations invite that as well. And, and learning all that we can in nature, reading books, other, other kinds of activities like playing an instrument or, or sewing will all inform your art. And it's so rich. 
It really is. And it's such a, it's what a beautiful way to be able to do that too. It's just such a blessing to be able to have all of these different influences for our art and inspiration for whatever we create. And I, and I really, I really love that. Um, this, this was actually a really fun exercise. Um, and I, I did, I made two boxes and I thought I'd be quick enough to go ahead and do them. And um, I got to play with different colors than I normally play with. And I play with different brushes. Um, but I, I'm gonna, I actually put my one brush to the side because I'm going to play with that a little bit more because uh, that has some unique shapes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, so thank you for doing this. I, uh, I know that you have created something magical for our community. And do you mind uh, letting everyone know what you created and tell us a little bit more um, about what you created and where we can find you. Okay. So what I created is it's a worksheet called zero to one because this was so powerful. Big concepts from mathematics and science and psychology and nature can really help your art and help you and invite you to create and to believe in yourself as you do that. So that's the gift I have for you. You can get it at artistsjourney.com forward slash gift. It'll be there for you. Just put your information in there. You can get that, download it. It's a worksheet to play with this idea. And you can find me at artistsjourney.com or nancyhillis.com will direct you to artistsjourney.com. And that particular exercise comes from my second book, which is The Artist's Journey, Creativity Reflection Journal. I'll show it to you right here. <laughs> I don't know if that's backwards or not, but... <laughs> it's not backwards. I oh, see good. it perfectly. I got mine. <laughs> Yay! So you can see it's like, it's very colorful, and it's a book for you to write down you know, zero to one documentation to bring, to bring visibility to, to your thoughts and your ideas and what, what matters to you. And it's really about meaning. What's the most meaningful to you. And, and that's the key. It's like, what is most meaningful to us? Because it really is our unique experiences, our unique challenges, um, just our unique way of solving our problems too. And um, it's just like your concept uh, with the gestural expression is that we do each of these uniquely. No one else can do them the way that we do them. And um, I really love that concept. So like, thank you so much for this. Yes. You know, I think the you, when you reached out to me, one of the things you said to me is that what really, one of the things that spoke to you was, there is this phrase, we don't know if it's German or it's Chinese, but it's find joy in your life. It's later than you think. And then I wrote a whole piece on, you know, dead women don't, don't paint, don't write books or play the cello. <laughs> so it's like, and I have actually, it's, it's, it, it's a thought experiment. It's in this book too. It's, it's uh, the deathbed, um, thought experiment and it is what is going to matter to you on your deathbed and this is a really good thought experiment to go through and to keep revisiting because that can change but you know I think oftentimes it's around relationships and love and the other piece is the the dreams the the dreams you have and did you, did you say yes to those dreams or are there unlived dreams in you still pushing for expression? And if so, listen to those and say yes to, to the dreams that are calling you. You know, Nancy, that is, you could not have said a more meaningful piece because that, I remember that article and I was in a certain spot in my life and like once I read that, I knew from that moment forward that I was going to be working towards my goals and my dreams of just writing and illustrating and creating and not 
you know, not for someone else that they like, oh, you've done great work here, you know, you're an artist finally, but actually creating the work because I desired so much to do so. And whether um, if people find them, um, uh, uh, you know, worthy or not is irrelevant, or if that was successful, what at the end of the day, what makes you a success is that you actually showed up and did your work and did that what you really wanted to do, whether it was validated or not. And um, I, I, I actually, like, I forgot that you had given me that moment. And thank you for reminding me of that, because that is the most powerful thing ever that I've seen on, you know, on paper is like, you know, dead, dead women do not write. And that is so yeah. true. And I'm never going to make my books and I'm never going to draw my paintings and I'm never going to tell the stories that are living deep inside me if I'm not creating. And I wonder how many other women have art that they want to create, stories to tell and all these things and not giving themselves permission because we have so many other priorities, just so much higher than that, you know? Yes, yes. And it's really saying yes to the dreams that live inside you. And if you'll listen, you'll notice them. And some of them have been there for years and it's time now. Now is the time to say yes. You are so right. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm so grateful that you come and you shared your wisdom and showed us some techniques that we can just learn to play with and create our own unique art. And I'm just so thankful that you joined us and um, are here with us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Misty. And thank you for what you're doing here. This is beautiful work. It's deeply meaningful. You're helping other people. You're encouraging artists and I want to thank all of you in the audience who are here and I encourage you to believe in yourself and say yes to your dreams get into your studio zero to one get in there and start experimenting yes I couldn't <laughs> agree more um, thank you so much guys for joining us and as you know later on this afternoon Nancy and I will be in Facebook live and there to answer any questions um, Nancy will help you with anything that you might uh, be stumbling with and anyway I hope everyone has a wonderful day and we will see you later on this afternoon bye guys bye there we go